Hello, and welcome to Understanding Adventist Beliefs. If you want to know more about Seventh-day Adventists and what they believe, this is for you. I have invited theological experts to join us for a frank discussion about Adventist faith and practice. We will explore the biblical reasons why Adventists believe what they confess in their fundamental beliefs. And we invite you to reflect with us in greater depth the biblical meaning, beauty, and relevance of Adventist beliefs. My name is Frank Hazel. I'm your host. And today we will look more closely at fundamental belief number 18, the gift of prophecy. Today I have the pleasure of having Dr. Merlin Burt and Keldy Parosky at my conversation partners. Dr. Bird is originally from the United States and currently is the director of the Ellen G. White Estate in Silver Spring, Maryland. Dr. Bird also serves as research professor of church history at the Seventh-day Adventist Theological Seminary at Andrews University in Berrien Springs, Michigan. He was founding director of the Center of Adventist Research at Andrews University and has authored many books and articles dealing with the gift of prophecy and early Adventist history. His passion is to connect God's leading in the past to a personal living Christian experience. Keldi Porosky is originally from Brazil, but has lived many years in Central Europe and currently is a PhD student in New Testament studies at Asbury Theological Seminary in Wilmore, Kentucky. I was born and raised in Germany and currently work as an associate director of the Biblical Research Institute at the world headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church in Silver Spring, Maryland. Merlin, Keldi, thank you for joining me in this conversation about the biblical teaching of the gift of prophecy and what it means for Seventh-day Adventists. Before we will start our discussion, I think it will be helpful to read the actual words of that fundamental belief, number 18, so that we have a better understanding of what we are talking about. So here I quote, the scriptures testify that one of the gifts of the Holy Spirit is prophecy. This gift is an identifying mark of the remnant church, and we believe it was manifested in the ministry of Ellen D. White. Her writings speak with prophetic authority and provide comfort, guidance, instruction, and correction to the church. They also make clear that the Bible is the standard by which all teaching and experience must be tested. So that's the wording of that fundamental belief. And uh, I would just like to start our conversation by raising a question. We have talked about fundamental belief number one, the first fundamental belief that we have as Seventh-day Adventists, and it deals with Scripture, the Bible. And we are uh, affirming sola scriptura. And so my question is, if the Bible is really the standard and test of experience and teaching, why then do we need uh, the prophetic gift today? Any ideas uh, as to what you would respond to that question? Well, the, maybe the best reason would be because the Bible itself said that there would be the prophetic gift. Mm -hmm. uh, in Joel 2, we have the statement of the end time, there would be a manifestation of the prophetic gift. We have uh, a whole interesting sequence in the book of Revelation that shows that the testimony of Jesus as revealed in the gift of prophecy would be present mm. at the end of time. So it's a, it's the, we're following the Bible mm -hmm. in doing that. <laughs> so it's back to that issue of the Bible being the rule of faith and we're, we're following it, at least so in my mind. So it, it grows out of scripture really yep. and uh, is faithful to what scripture affirms. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's what I hear you. Yes. Yeah, I think another point also is how the the gift of prophecy is um, specifically for edifying and helping the church, um, and this is you know something that is constantly important, especially uh, in the times in which we live in now. So um, it, it doesn't take away at all from sola scriptura, from the role of scripture. It's a it's a matter of 
different roles and how they are acting and, and contributing into the church. Hmm. I think. Okay. So um, when we say that scripture is sufficient, mm -hmm. that scripture is enough for everything we need to know in order to be saved, uh, why then um, do we still need the prophetic gift? Why does scripture affirm that we still need the prophetic gift then? Well, God loves us. Hmm. And he's given us the word. Yes, it's a precious thing. And it's, it is the basis of our experience, our faith, our understanding. But he cares about us. And in his word, he said that there would be maybe this need for the prophetic gift at times. And so if he gives it, it's because he loves us and he wants to help us. Mm -hmm. So it becomes this great blessing if we have that, if God hmm. does that. And it's something that is important because if God cares enough to do that, wow, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. And I would add also, you mentioned that, you know, the Bible is what tells us everything we need to know about salvation. And that is true. The Bible is our rule of faith. It's where we get our doctrines from, uh, where we learn about the plan of salvation of God. Um, the prophetic gift doesn't replace that. It um, helps us point back, uh, helps point us back to that and helps us um, understand better what does that mean and how can we um, find God in that way that scripture tells us about. So it's it's really a matter of different roles and pointing us back to scripture, pointing us toward that salvation that is found in scripture. So there is really no contradiction between right. the prophetic gift, prophecy, and the Bible, mm -hmm. unless you separate the two mm -hmm. from each other. So uh, let me let me just follow up on um, on that particular thought. You know, in, in that fundamental belief, we have read that uh, Seventh-day Adventists believe that this prophetic gift has been manifested, especially in the life and ministry of one particular person, mm -hmm. Ellen White. So who, who is Ellen White? Mm -hmm. Can you tell us a little bit more about her and why Adventists believe that Ellen White was a fulfillment of that prophetic gift that Scripture talks about? Well, Ellen White was a, really a person of the 19th century early 20th century, hmm. which is the period of the beginning of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Mm -hmm. And her, her first receiving of prophetic visions and dreams happens in the context of those first years mm -hmm. as the Seventh-day Adventist Church would emerge out of the Millerite movement, mm -hmm. which was looking for Jesus to come very soon. And so she, along with two others, become a part of the founding group of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So her, her prophetic role is complemented also by a role of, of the beginning and the emergence of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Mm -hmm. So there are, there are several reasons why she is an important figure uh, for Seventh-day Adventists, okay? Well, and it's meaningful that during this time when, when she was starting to have these visions and, and things, um, that this is connected to, like you said, the Millerite movement, which uh, emerged out of a studying of prophecy in Scripture. Um, and in Scripture, these two things go together, these uh, specific events within salvation history that prophecy points us toward and the emergence of uh, the gift of prophecy as well. So historically, it's all connected just as we see um, it being talked about in Scripture. Hmm. So uh, let's unfold that a little bit more. So she lived during the 19th century, early 20th century. Uh, that's quite uh, some time ago. Um, we uh, Adventists see that the prophetic gift was somehow uh, manifested in her ministry and her life. And uh, can you explain that a little bit more what, uh, so that we can understand what we mean by that? Her experience um, in, begins as just a young girl. Mm. I mean, th this is the remarkable thing. I mean, when she had her first vision, she was 17 years old. Mm. And she begins to well, deal with this because she didn't seek it. Uh, she was in a, a, a group with four other women just having a prayer and family worship. And this special power of God came upon her. And she then had to come to understand what that meant. And God began to explain to her her work. 
And that would then unfold over a period of more than a little over 70 years. And she herself grew in that understanding and was learning and God kept revealing things to her. And God used that prophetic gift in such a precious way to help those believers who were coming together around the Bible teaching that would become the foundation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Mm -hmm. And it became a powerful um, spiritual help for them. Mm -hmm. So it grew out of very humble yeah. beginnings, so mm -hmm. to speak, then. Well, yeah. and I, I think that's a fascinating part of her story and shows really the power of God working in her life because she's a young girl, um, didn't have a lot of education, um, health-wise wasn't doing very well as well. So we really see this powerful ministry coming out of somebody who you least would have expected. Um, and I think that says a lot about how what God can do through people. Yeah. Reminds me a little bit of, of, of God's dealing with his people uh, in biblical times. He usually chooses not the high standing um, big tribes or big people, you know, he, he goes to the least of them and out of the least of the smallest, something em emerges that is really truly amazing and ultimately uh, gives glory to God and not to any human being. Mm -hmm. And so there is there's a similar pattern here, if, if we could say that. Yeah, and I think that really speaks a lot to, this is something that was God's work. This wasn't, mm -hmm. you know, her being very smart or coming up with all these amazing ideas. This is really God's work. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that builds confidence in her work and her ministry and in her writings. Now, let me ask you this. We are talking about the prophetic gift here. If I recall correctly, uh, Ellen White never used the word prophet for herself. Uh, the term that she preferred was messenger of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So um, if she doesn't use the, or claim the title prophet for herself, why do we see the prophetic gift in her? Uh, any, any ideas uh, as to uh, what you would say to that? Yeah, the, the, the term messenger of the Lord is a bigger term in a way hmm. than the word prophet. How is that? In that it can include prophet, okay. but it can include other things as well. And this is her meaning in using the term. She wasn't saying, I'm not a prophet, hmm. but she knew that when people said, I'm a prophet, there were other prophetic claimants, hmm. and many of them we're putting what they were doing on the same basis as the Bible, making it additional scripture, um, sharing things that were really counter scripture, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and people would then associate her with this. And so she didn't put that word forward, but she didn't reject it. I like the way, way she described it okay. in one place in um, a, a, one of her writings. It was in a letter she wrote. She, she said, my com commission embraces the work of a prophet, but it does not end there. It embraces much more than the minds of those who have been sowing seeds of unbelief can comprehend. Mm -hmm. So when you think of her work, you know, I mentioned a little bit, she was one of the founders mm -hmm, of the mm -hmm. movement with James White mm -hmm, and Joseph mm -hmm, Bates, mm -hmm. but she was also a counselor. Mm -hmm. She was a unifier. She was a revivalist. She was a founder of institutions and ministries. Mm. She was a fundraiser. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. She was a powerful temperance advocate. Uh, yes. And, and the list goes on and on. She was an on. abolitionist she as was, well. She was an abolitionist, missionary. a missionary. She went to Europe. She went to Australia. Different continents uh, and no airplanes at that time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, when she describes what I just read, this particular statement, she listed some things. She first mentioned, well, there's, I do have visions. So this prophetic supernatural element of direct divine revelation was present. Mm -hmm. But then she goes on to describe herself that she was a health reformer, hmm. medical missionary, that she was teaching sanctification for God's service, which hmm. is sort of like mm -hmm. a revivalist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And well, I won't mention them all, but she no, even mentioned, but she mentions this one, which is very interesting that she was to reprove oppressors mm -hmm. and plead for justice from ministers who were arbitrary and overbearing in their official authority. Hmm. 
Very interesting. And then care for the aged ministers and care for orphans. We don't realize sometimes, but she did care for people. Her home mm. was often full of people. So there's this broad work mm. that she has. And so we usually uh, associate with a prophet, someone who prophesies about the future and makes predictions about this and that. And yet the work of a prophet, even a biblical prophet, is so much more and broader than just making prophecies. That is part of it. But uh, the prophet had an important role to play in biblical times mm -hmm. to uh, point out uh, things uh, in God's people that needed re reform, correction maybe, guidance, yeah. and uh, encouragement even. And uh, so you see a, a similar, similar work in Ellen White. Yeah, um, in 1 Corinthians 14 verse 4, Paul talks about how the one who prophesies builds up the church. Mm. Um, this whole chapter he talks about, you know, different spiritual gifts and, and how the, the ultimate purpose of these spiritual gifts should be to edify the church, to help the church grow in faith and love um, and sanctification. And really that's what we see manifested in her ministry. It's all about helping and guiding God's church and um, pointing back to scripture, helping them to just really grow. And I, Could you, could you, yeah, go ahead. Uh, I, when she said pointing back to scripture, uh -huh. that one really jumped out for me because if you read Ellen White's writings, the thing that comes through strongest is her reference to scripture. She is not just passionate about scripture, her language, hmm. her, her, way of, yes. uh, the, her way of presenting is mm -hmm. scriptural. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So she's not, it's not like there's Ellen White and there's scripture. It is like Ellen White is going to scripture. Mm -hmm. She's taking us to scripture. She's passionate about scripture. She's drawing the scripture to us uh, yeah, and her books reveal this and her that's true her letters her writings even when she's not directly quoting scripture it's always echoing some part of scripture you've already read or some verses her whole language is really just mm -hmm. saturated like you said yeah and it's interesting uh, i've i've done a study some time ago on her use of scripture and it's mm -hmm. interesting she's not just quoting from one particular section of the bible it's, it's almost, you know, every single book uh, in the Bible that she references or uh, refers to, is she, her whole thinking is saturated yeah. with scripture really. And, uh, and that's true. Um, I've never seen her pointing people to herself. Mm -hmm. It's always pointing her to the word, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To, the, to the greater light, so to speak. And, uh, and uh, that is something significant, I think, that, uh, uh, that we appreciate as Seventh-day Adventists. If, if I could just say a little bit about that a little more. Please. Because when you look at her writings, her first publication in a booklet form was a little tract called The Sketch of the Christian Experience and Views of Ellen G. White, mm -hmm. 64 pages. So it has an interesting description of her first visions and some other things. It's a very nice little tract. It's now in the book Early Writings. Mm -hmm. But when you come to the end of the tract, she summarizes her work. Hmm. Mm. She summarizes what's most important to her. And this little statement here, she says, I recommend to you, dear reader, the word of God as the rule of your faith and practice. This is the beginning of her work. <laughs> you see, it's to recommend the Bible as a rule of faith and practice. And then she says, by that word, we are to be judged. God has in that word promised to give visions in the last days, not as a new rule of faith, mm -hmm. but for the comfort of his people mm -hmm. and to correct those who err from Bible truth. Very powerful mm -hmm. uh, little statement. Oh, Merlin, this is, this is interesting. This is exciting. <laughs> you know, when you said this was actually her first public statement uh, that she made, it reminded me of her last public statement. Yes. Maybe you want to share that story uh, to us where she spoke at a general conference session and was already leaving yeah. the pulpit and uh, tell us what yeah. happened there. It was, it was the 1909 general conference session mm. uh, held not far from, well, from here. And she had finished her message and she went back to the pulpit and she, she took the Bible and she held it up and she says, 
brethren, I recommend to you this book, mm -hmm. this book. So she begins, it really wasn't quite her end. It was her last words to the General All Conference right, okay. of the World Church. She would go on for another six years, mm -hmm, continue mm -hmm, to mm -hmm. say things. But it was her last message to the assembled leadership mm -hmm, of the mm -hmm, church. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So it's central to her. Mm -hmm, it's, mm -hmm. it's important. And you would expect this from a true prophet. Exactly. That's right. A, a false prophet will do something else. They will point to themselves, they'll mm -hmm. point to some sensational idea that they're presenting, or who knows what else. There's many other So things. how has the prophet Isaiah worded it back to? The law and the, the testimony. Law and the testimony. So that's really what we find in her ministry, that she is referring back to scripture, back to the Bible as the norm uh, of, of all we believe. That's the test of, of a true prophet according to, to scripture, right? It's um, that the true prophet will profess Jesus as Lord, will profess that Jesus came in the flesh, and it doesn't contradict previous revelation. Um, on the contrary, it points to that, it confirms that, and that's exactly what we see in her uh, ministry. She believed in Jesus and talked about Jesus, his love and his ministry, everything that he came to do for us, his work of salvation, and um, always pointing back to scripture. So really, if we're basing ourselves here off of scripture, off of the test that scripture itself provides, and, and going to her writings, to her life, her ministry, and seeing if those fruits are manifested, and I believe they are. Yeah. Hmm. So the prophetic gift really um, is not given and should not be exercised in any way to do away with scripture, mm -hmm. or to avoid scripture, mm -hmm. or to supersede scripture. Or and, add to scripture. Or add exactly. to scripture. But it unfolds what God has given in the Bible mm -hmm. and affirms that as the standard. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah, and there's a unity. Mm -hmm. it, it, a true prophet, a modern prophet, if you're gonna, if, when that happens, there's going to be a unity of of revelation of understanding with scripture. Mm -hmm. It's not gonna go somewhere else. Right. It's gonna be right there mm -hmm. because God is God. Mm -hmm. he, he has revealed throughout history, mm -hmm. which is what the Bible is. And he's gonna continue to be that way. Exactly. So, so let's, let's talk a little bit more about that uh, important relationship between the writings of Ellen White and the Bible. How would you describe that connection? Uh, do we believe that Ellen White was inspired? Mm -hmm. uh, like Bible writers, and doesn't that make her equal to the Bible? And what, what would you say to that? No, that's, that's a good one. <laughs> um, a, an inspired person receives prophetic revelation from God in a supernatural way. It's, it's either is or it isn't. Mm -hmm. So it, it isn't that you have more inspired, less inspired. Mm -hmm. What you have is purpose. Exactly. Hmm. Yeah. And this is the key point. And Ellen White defines her purpose, which is not more scripture, it's to scripture. Mm -hmm. It's the message of scripture in a modern setting. So um, you have this sense, and you have in the Bible the same sort of thing revealed. And you have people in the Bible who didn't write the Bible, mm -hmm. who yet are inspired prophets. Mm -hmm. Give us an example. Oh, there's a whole long list. Some <laughs> of our favorite people, hmm. Abraham. Okay. You know, the beginning. You could even go earlier. But, and you just walk down through history. Jacob, you think of the key patriarchs. They didn't write scripture. Now, scripture has things about them, mm -hmm. some mm -hmm. things from them. And Elijah, even the prophet. Elijah yeah. is another example. Mm -hmm. uh, and in the New Testament, you have the same thing. You have people. So there are many people who are not writers of the Bible who, Yet who were, were used by God. Mm -hmm. And there, there's a fascinating example. that It's one of my favorites just because it shows this issue of, of God calling a prophet, whether they write scripture or not, they're mm -hmm. still inspired. I think of the story of Nathan, the mm -hmm. prophet, mm -hmm. and David. David yeah. it's, it's kind of, a, there's a delicate story there about David being, well, arranging to take another man's wife and arranging for that man to be killed. And yet Nathan is a prophet whom God sends to rebuke David. And David accepts it, thankfully. Mm -hmm. But the mm -hmm. irony is that David is a canonical prophet. Mm 
<laughs> not not when he's doing those things. We're not <laughs> supporting those yeah, things. Yeah, but he wrote the Psalms. Psalms he wrote yeah. Psalms. So it, it says a lot about prophets too. Mm, mm. But you have a, you have an equivalence of authority in that sense of inspiration, but the purpose is different. And Ellen White's very clear that her purpose is not to be additional scripture, mm -hmm. but to take us to the scripture. Um, let me just add uh, an interesting parallel between Ellen White and some of these non-canonical prophets who didn't write scripture, um, is they show up in very key moments in history mm. that, that the people of God really needed somebody to point them to the right direction or um, to reveal something important about what God was doing. Um, and we see that in her ministry as well. She comes up in a very um, crucial part of time in history. And um, that's, you know, the purpose of her ministry is within that special um, time and place. So, um, uh, like you were saying, it's that that difference of role. It's not difference in authority. It's not difference in level of inspiration or anything like that. It's what's her role hmm. at that time when God um, called her, basically. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it would be strange indeed, you know, if God throughout history uh, has sent uh, his special messengers, mm -hmm. his prophets, to his people to guide them in, in crucial times, as you said. And during the last time of earth history, he would not send anybody. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, would, uh, it would be in harmony, really, with his dealing with hum humanity if, if that were to be continued. And that's actually what Scripture tells us, that the prophetic gift has not ceased mm -hmm. uh, with New Testament times, but is something that is continuing uh, as a blessing to the church to upbuild the church and build the church. Sometimes people have asked me in my work with the White Estate, so why don't you have a, why isn't there a prophet now that you can point to? Good question. I wanted to ask that question. <laughs> <laughs> because here, here Ellen White died in 1915, mm -hmm. and it's like, well, if you're, you have modern prophets, why, why yes, don't you have yes. a modern prophet on. right now? I mean. Aren't there more? <laughs> yeah. But our understanding of the gift of prophecy is, is special in this sense that the church doesn't decide people don't decide, well, we need a prophet, so let's get a prophet. Hmm. Hmm. It's a divine mm -hmm. action. Divine appointment. It's a so divine it. appointment, and it's in his time mm -hmm. and on his terms. And I think God expects us to respect and appreciate what he has given, too, because mm -hmm. sometimes you think, mm -hmm. well, if I don't have something new, then it's, you know, what's old doesn't matter as much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if Revelation through history teaches us anything. Mm. Everything God's revealed is mm. important. Mm. And let me just point out, it's very interesting. You both mentioned here something. Um, when we're talking about these kind of things in other denominations, on, on the one hand, we see some of them affirming that these spiritual gifts um, ended with the uh, apostles, so ended in the New Testament times. They don't continue into today. And on the other hand, we have other denominations who see these gifts everywhere all the time. And it's interesting that we as Seventh-day Adventists, we're kind of in the middle. <laughs> it didn't end in New Testament times, mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, it's not something that's all over the place. We are very criterious in who we identify as a prophet, and it's not, you know, all over the place, like I've said. So it's, I think it's an interesting balance that we have in our church. So is there a difference between a prophet and a uh, prophesying. Mm -hmm. uh, well, are there more people who prophesy, but there are fewer people who are actually prophets? Or is that a, a wrong distinction? Yeah, how, how do you define prophesying? What does that mean? Mm. You know, in a way, we, we talk about, I mean, I'm, I was a pastor for a number of years. Mm. Now, I don't have, I'm not a prophet. I would never claim <laughs> it. I've not had visions, prophetic dreams, direct revelation. That hasn't happened for me. Mm. But I have in the pulpit felt the power of God upon me. Mm, mm. And I have felt the Lord preaching, helping me to preach and speak in a, in a way that I just, I'm, I feel as if I'm a vessel of the Lord. Mm, mm. So that is a legitimate work of the Holy Spirit. And we should expect that. And we should, and, and many should have that. Mm -hmm. In fact, maybe most or even all in some level should have that. But there's a, a, a unique thing that God does mm. 
Hmm. And we, we need to, it, it's a part of the continuity of his spirit's working, but it, it is unique in that he directly asks and speaks to certain people and says, represent me. Mm -hmm. You need to share this. And it's new information many times, usually. It's clear guidance on a level that we don't have through the impressions of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. in quite the mm -hmm. same way. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's very interesting. Now let me, let me uh, follow up on uh, an idea that, that has uh, come up here. Ellen White lived um, quite some time ago, you know, she died 1915. And, um, and yet, um, her work and her writings, her ministry somehow continues, even in the mm -hmm. Seventh-day Adventist Church. And, and even today, people might be surprised when they see there is a new book written by Ellen White. But how come that there is a new book by Ellen White if she has died, you know, many years ago? Can you shed some light on that and, and how that functions and works? Uh, of course. Uh, Ellen White wrote the book she wrote during a lifetime. And of course, when she fell asleep in Jesus, <laughs> 1915, she stopped writing. <laughs> we, we, we would never, th in fact, one of her things that she was shown was that spiritualism was a false teaching, this idea mm -hmm, of life mm -hmm, after death. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But uh, her, her writings were much more extensive. Do we have an idea how much she wrote or how extensive her writing ministry was? Well, during her lifetime, it's hard to define a books because there's some booklets. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But somewhere around 50, we would say maybe mm -hmm. books during her lifetime, maybe a bit more if you take some of the smaller ones. And then she wrote letters she and wrote manuscripts. She wrote thousands of articles in mm -hmm. periodicals. Mm -hmm. And those were one-offs. You know, they were in the periodical. Mm -hmm. And so if you don't have that periodical, you wouldn't have it. And then she wrote letters, hmm. uh, tens of thousands of pages of letters over her lifetime. Do we still have those letters? Absolutely. Or? In fact, they're all available online hmm. on the White Estate websites. There's so it's a, not a secret then? No, no. It's every, the, her letters in, are available, her periodical mm -hmm. materials, even her manuscript materials, her books that he, she published, the posthumous books. And that's the thing that happens. Yeah, you have yeah. posthumous compilations. Okay. And there's different types of compilations that are done. And so if you see a book from Ellen White, uh, the White Estate's responsible for preparing most of those. Now you mentioned White Estate. Not everybody might yes. be familiar with that particular term or institution. Yeah, let, let me explain what that is. When Ellen White died in 1915, she mm -hmm. had a will. Mm -hmm. that she, she left her writings in the custody of five people and they were to be follow the guidance of her will, which included making available her writings. Hmm. There were a number of other things that they were commissioned to do, several mm -hmm. other things. Mm -hmm. And so they began to work on that. One of those things is translating mm -hmm. uh, into other languages, mm -hmm. and that's an important work I'm involved in. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It is uh, helping people to understand her writings. So that work has continued uh, with the White Estate. Some people think, oh, it's properties, you're managing properties. No. <laughs> It's her, her, her estate, mm -hmm. which was really her writings and what she, what she had done in her ministry. So, but anyway, you were, you were asking me about the, um, the books that have come out. Uh, we prepare every five years a devotional book. Hmm. And it's not trying to bring new material from Ellen White. Mm -hmm. Our latest one is Jesus' Name Above All Names. Hmm. And it, it brings together some of the more than 800 names or ways of referring to Jesus that Ellen White does. It's a very powerful devotional book. Mm -hmm. And so that's... Yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. We, we had in earlier years uh, some books that were put together that brought like selected messages, volume one through three, that brought some of her important writings that she had never actually put into print. She didn't have time in her mm -hmm. lifetime. Mm -hmm. So there's different types of things. So it's actually um, according what she wanted to see that things will be published even after she had died and be made available to the wider audience and reader, readership. It's very nice. Yeah, so we have that um, 
It, you, you mentioned the White Estate. What, what is the White Estate? The White Estate is an organization that is, uh, a, it's really a corporation that comes out of her will. Uh -huh. So it has its own board. So it has a type of independence. She intended that. Okay. Sort of like her work was a little bit independent okay. from the church. But she named key church leaders when she first mm -hmm. established mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. White Estate. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. the president of the General Conference, publishing director, several mm -hmm. others. Mm -hmm. Her mm -hmm. son was uh, one of her trustees. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so that has continued to the present as a part of the church. So it's connected to the church in the, the sense that it has really key people that are leaders, uh, trustees of the White Estate, and it is connected budgetarily with the church now, mm -hmm. but it is still an organization with a particular purpose mm -hmm. to help people um, have trust and understanding of Ellen White's writings and be able to have them available. So everything she wrote uh, uh, that we are aware of uh, is still available you said is uh, we have her letters we have the manuscripts we have the books that she wrote and uh, that is also available at the white estate if mm -hmm. if if i'm not mistaken yes and you said uh it's it's also available digitally mm -hmm. on the internet so i appreciate that transparency you know it's it's not that is if uh, we have to hide something that nobody should see you know and this and access, that but yeah. uh we make it available to whoever is interested in, uh, in these questions. I have a quick question. Um, you mentioned that one of the works of the White Estate is to help people understand her better. And I've heard some people talking about how, oh, she writes, you know, 100 years ago. It's difficult language. And um, has, has there been some attempts to maybe like update her language? Or is this something we're trying not to do? Yeah. How do we approach that kind of that, that is an interesting question. Mm -hmm. um, there have been some books mm -hmm. that have been, well, the devotionals, for example, will have, she would write in the 19th century, they would write mm -hmm. using the masculine form, mm -hmm. which included both genders. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, today we would say, ooh, that's terrible. Yeah. <laughs> in her day, I mean, here she is a woman right. doing this. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't that she was trying to um, screen out women, mm -hmm. so to speak. So the devotionals, for example, they, they have had, they do have mm -hmm. gender, um, I don't know if the word neutral is the right word we should use, but uh, not focusing yeah. the inclusive. way it, it was, gender it's inclusive, inclusive right? gender. Yeah. And, but generally we've tried, or we have tried to make sure that her writings are, have integrity, they yeah. are her writings. Mm -hmm. But we have released some books that have uh, the updated language a little bit. Uh, for example, the book Steps to Christ, mm -hmm. I think probably, the, not probably, the most beloved Ellen White book. Um, powerful as it's written, but it has been, there is an update called Steps to Jesus, mm. which makes the language a little more contemporary. Mm -hmm. It takes out some of the old English words, yeah. and so it's, it's clearly designated that that's what it is. And that helps people some. And I really appreciate that, not, not, only, not only because it makes it more accessible and understandable for people today, but also um, I think it says something about how we approach her writings. Um, it's not like, you know, um, verbatim scripture or something like that. It's really about the message and how it is communicated and how it helps people understand God better. Mm -hmm. yeah. And at the same time, as you said, there is an an awareness of integrity exactly. to, to what she really wrote mm -hmm. and not to alter that mm -hmm. uh, yeah. in any significant it, way. Yeah. In any of the books where that is done, it's clearly noted mm -hmm. on the cover, mm -hmm. in the beginning, that what it is. Mm -hmm. And it's not never an attempt mm -hmm. to somehow substitute that mm -hmm. for what she actually mm -hmm. wrote. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we're yeah, that's important very careful on yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. So um, maybe just an, another little question following up on what you said. You know, if, if you go on the Internet or even talk with other people, sometimes uh, you come across uh, some strange uh, views 
even on Ellen White uh, in the Adventist Church, claiming this or claiming that, and she did this or she didn't do that, you know, and, and so forth. So if a person wanted to uh, find out what is really happening here, what, what, are there answers to some of these questions, where would you direct them? Well, you would maybe expect me as director of the White Estate to <laughs> point people to the White Estate, but I, I would do that if I weren't director. Okay, why? Because there, there is a collection of valuable resources that you can find. There are answers, questions and answers that you have mm. with, that actually goes to the original manuscripts, materials. Mm. So there, there is a reciting of stories that isn't always accurate mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. often mm -hmm. is inaccurate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so to have that uh, ability to uh, yourself kind of check that mm -hmm. is very important. And we provide that at the, at the White House. That's very so. nice. Mm -hmm. We are very good to know because usually, you know, when you come across a question or, or something that uh, is unfamiliar to you, uh, it's very likely that other people have noticed that as well. You're not the first one. <laughs> And uh, if that is the case, it's, it's very likely that maybe an answer has been given to that particular question already. Mm -hmm. And uh, so not that this is the final word, but it can be a helpful step mm -hmm. in approaching some of these questions that are out there. There are also some good books that have been written. Okay. Um, I think you'll show them in connection yeah. with this. Mm -hmm. uh, there's several very good resources that have been published in recent years. I mean, there's a large book called The Encyclopedia hmm. of Ellen White which covers many of these type of questions yes, people have. Yes. You just have to go and look at it. It's very helpful. Mm, mm. And several other books that we can mention. There's a book, Understanding Ellen White, mm. that I edited that had mm -hmm. a number of authors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And The Gift of Prophecy and Scripture and History, edited by uh, Dwayne Esmond and Alberto Tim. Anyway, I could mention other books. There are some really valuable resources that would help people to understand better if they have questions. So, so let me let me um, let me ask a more personal, practical question. You know, we've talked about Ellen White, we've heard about her ministry, we we touched on many uh, interesting uh, facets. But if there is a person who has never had uh, never had an opportunity to read anything from Ellen White so far, where would you guide that person to start reading? With all the many books that she wrote, is is there something that that you would recommend uh, go to that particular book and, and start there before? If you haven't read anything from Ellen White, I would recommend the book Steps to Christ. Mm -hmm. Steps to Christ. It's a smaller book. You can't read it fast. Uh, maybe you can, but each paragraph, each sentence is impactful. Mm -hmm. And it's translated into the most languages of any Ellen White book. Uh, so in my mind, that would be a first book. Okay. Uh, there are, the other key books that she wrote during her lifetime are really important. Uh, her, her life work was to build an understanding of the battle between good and evil. Hmm. I think you've already or have discussed in this fundamental mm -hmm. series mm -hmm. on the great controversy mm -hmm. between Christ and Satan. And this five volume series that mm. she wrote, we mm. call it the Conflict of the Ages series. It goes from before sin began, what we know, and it's, a, it's based on the Bible. You can almost read through those five books with your Bible, yeah. and it just brings the Bible alive yes. in a powerful yes, way. Yes. But it comes right down to the end of time. Mm. So that would be a good thing to do. I mean, if someone wants to really study Ellen White, you okay. read those okay. five books yeah. with the Bible. But uh, another favorite book of mine is the book Desire of Ages. It's, yes. it's in the middle of the Conflict of the Ages series. It's on the life of Christ. It's a big book, but it doesn't seem so big. It's a beautiful it. book. It's, it's beautiful. powerful yeah. on the yes. life of Jesus. Yeah. Uh, you, you just cannot ch help being changed mm -hmm. and impacted reading that book and connecting to Jesus. It, it brings a passionate love for Jesus in my heart mm. when I read it mm. that just is... Yeah, I can confirm that. Uh, it's, a, it's a very beautiful book. Um, and if you are interested in Jesus, even slightly, you know, uh, you will benefit greatly just by reading that. And it will lead you back into Scripture, really. It, uh, 
it will motivate you to read the Gospels again mm -hmm. and to, to meditate on, on what Jesus went through and, mm -hmm. and how he encountered different people and, and how she shares that and the beauty of who he was and the savior uh, of the world. Uh, it's, it's just a, a fantastic book. Mm -hmm. Um, a third book, if I were going to name my three favorites. <laughs> sure, sure. The third would probably be the book Great Controversy. Great Controversy. Why Great Controversy? It's a different sort of book. It's more historical, but it paints a picture from the time of Jesus to the very end of time and, and opens up biblically, but also in what she was shown, how God is going to work in our day and how the soon coming of Jesus is before us how he's working, how, what Satan is doing, how God is working. Very, very powerful mm. book. Mm. Very, very helpful for people. Or anyone who is interested in history, mm -hmm. yeah. or church history for that matter, and wants to understand a little better what is going on even behind the scenes, mm. so to speak, uh, from God's perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, that's a, a very powerful, uh, impactful book. Yes, I agree. Yeah, any additional thoughts? I was Your favorite book was mentioned already. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are several other good books, just to give honorable mentions. I don't mean to do that. They're all wonderful. But, um, she writes on certain key theme, themes, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. like education. Mm -hmm. I mean, education is my area. You're in the midst yeah. of a doctoral program. I know you're a theologian. I know some say, oh, well, that's too highfalutin. Well, education is a basic thing. Mm -hmm and it's oriented towards God. And she wrote a book, Education. Mm. And, and the integration of faith and learning. Faith and learning, it's, it's powerful. And then her book on, on health, hmm. Ministry of Healing, which is more than just our own health. It's about how God loves us and he wants us to minister to people mm. in a healing way. Um, the book, Christ Object Lessons, mm. uh, hmm. on the parables of Jesus. Uh, there's just a number of other Many, very, yeah. very, yes, very yes, helpful yes. Books. Yes. No, I agree. I, I, some, some time ago I heard a person uh, raise that question, uh, which is the best book <laughs> to read from Ellen White? And, and the answer was the best book is the one you read. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. <laughs> because you, know, you yeah. might hear a lot of interesting things about her, but uh, go to one of her books and start reading. I mean, there is just nothing better than that. It's the same with scripture. You might hear many things about the Bible, but there is nothing better than reading the Bible yourself, you know, and, uh, and so the same holds true really for her uh, as well. And, and I think if you do that with an open heart and open mind, you will be richly blessed uh, by, by doing that. And that's what scripture tells us to do, right? To test everything based on scripture. And in order to do that, we have to spend time, we have to read, we have to give it a try. And that, that's what really is going to be impactful and changing mm -hmm. for, for yeah we, we've talked about Ellen White here mm -hmm. and that's good we need to understand it's it's mentioned in our fundamental beliefs because God used that gift so powerfully in our church but if you don't read mm -hmm. you don't know that's just right that's right we have to read and to me it connects me to Jesus mm -hmm. That is the fundamental issue. Mm, mm, mm. Uh, her, her writings played a role even in my own conversion mm. to a degree. And reading them is the, is the key. Mm. Mm. So let me pick up on, on that uh, personal note that you just mentioned. So if, if I were to ask you what, for you personally, uh, what is the significance of Ellen White uh, in your life? What, what is the beauty of her uh, in your Christian walk? Uh, any thoughts that you would like to share here? <laughs> I think for me is really how she talks about the love of God hmm. and how, you know, we have a messy story of sin and death and everything wrong that's happening in this world and here we have a God who loves us so much um, who sent his son to die for us but it's through her writings we can appreciate that love and feel that love in such a powerful way that is life-changing it's transforming and it makes you love God even more mm. as well um, I think that for me is probably the most significant um, aspect of 
you know, whenever I read any of her writings, regardless what the topic is, it always points us back to mm. God is love and how much he loves us mm. and how much he wants to be in a relationship with us. It reminds me of, uh, you mentioned that series of books, the five books that she wrote, The Great Controversy is part of that. Uh, and it starts in the first book. Yes. The first sentence, she starts yes. with the love of God and the final book, you know, yeah. the ends uh, that the love of God is restored, you know, and, and so from beginning to end, really, that's the story exactly. that, uh, that she wanted to communicate uh, so powerfully, and mm -hmm. she did. Yeah, so the love of God is an important aspect. What about you? You, you can't go very far from that love of God theme. <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you, I, it, it is the Bible. I mean, when you read the Bible, I mean, I love Paul for that reason. Mm -hmm. uh, I love John for that reason. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, it, you, you get a picture of God through Jesus that is transformational. Mm. You, we don't even know what love is. And, and God's love begins to be dawn on us what it is. And Ellen White, the same thing happens when you read her writings. Mm -hmm. I, I, I think of some of the things that she's written and her own passionate love for him. It, it, it's like this flowing, mm -hmm. her revealing of his love, mm -hmm. and then her, her passionate response to it. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. One of my favorite little statements, if it's not too little, mm -hmm. but if, you, if mm -hmm. you'll indulge me sure. to read maybe <laughs> this powerful thing. It's in the book Testimonies, which okay. is written personally to people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but it shows how, how a, to a person how passionate it is. And she's talking about the paternal love of God now. I realize we have bad parental models and bad fatherly models, but this is the right father, our heavenly father. And she says it this way, all the paternal love, which has come down from generation hmm. to generation through the channel of human hearts. In other words, the best fatherly love. I can relate to it. I have three children. Mm -hmm. I have six grandchildren. I, I know what, I, I love my children, I love my grandchildren. So she's talking now about this love, mm. and there's maternal, mm, mm, mm. but right now she's talking about paternal. She says, all of that love is but a tiny rill. This is a little stream that dries up when the sun comes out to the boundless ocean when compared with the infinite, exhaustless love of God. Tongue cannot utter it, pen cannot portray it, you may meditate upon it every day of your life. You may search the scriptures diligently in order to understand and comprehend the love and compassion of the Heavenly Father. Listen to this. And yet there is an infinity beyond. You may study that love for ages, yet you can never fully comprehend the length and the breadth, the depth and the height of the love of God in giving His Son to die for the world Eternity itself can never fully reveal it. Yet as we study the Bible and meditate upon the life of Christ and the plan of redemption, these great themes open to our understanding more and more. That's a beautiful, I mean, isn't that incredible? Beautiful. And then her, her reaction to it, I mean, <laughs> she preached, you know, she preached mm, sermons, mm, mm, lots mm, of sermons. Mm. And this one was in 1888, Minneapolis. She closed one of her sermons with these words kind of a reaction sure. to this in scripture. And mm -hmm. she says, oh, I love him. I love him for he is my love. Can you imagine that standing in the pulpit? Mm -hmm. The messenger of the Lord. Oh, I love him. I love him for he is my love. I see in him matchless charms. And oh, how I want that we shall enter in through the gates of that city. You know, beautiful, passionate about the love of Jesus mm -hmm. in her reaction to it as well. So it's the love of God in Christ, the, the character of God that's revealed in her writings. You know, and that's, that's really the, the theme, the subject, the thought that touches everyone yeah. because we are all created to be capable of love, giving love, receiving love, being open to God's love. And, and if there is something about that uh, original love of God from which all other human love flows, you know, and it's just a reflection. Uh, it touches something in you that resonates. And I think that's the beauty of, of what you just read. And by the way, I think that is one of the reasons you, you mentioned that, that uh, beautiful quote, the first one, and there's an infinity beyond, you know. Yeah. 
infinity is a, is a very long time, especially at the end, you know, because there is no end. <laughs> and and it, it means that, you know, if you reflect on the love of God, eternity will never be boring. Mm -hmm. We sometimes have a wrong conception about heaven and eternity and all that goes. But if that is true, and I think it is, you know, it never will be boring. It will be a time where we will understand the most important things to our human existence even better and deeper. And the impact on our relationships yes. with each other. Mm -hmm. yes. I mean, God's love is the right love. It's the perfect representation of what the right love is. And when we connect with Him, we begin to experience and have that same type of love. Yes, mm -hmm. yes. And it's the power of Christianity. And it's, it's, and it's the, it's the driving the force really behind all the other things. You know, you might be uh, amazed at what she wrote about education. You might be uh, surprised how advanced her views were on, on many health issues mm -hmm. compared to the, th to the things of her time. And it's uh, beautiful and uh, powerful uh, insights that she gives us here. But it's driven by that love. It's, it's you know, it, that's the, the force that drives it all and uh, it gives the right perspective. So let's close with that uh, idea. I think we, we could talk about many other things, but uh, we've given a, an in interesting introduction, I think. If you want to learn more about um, the prophetic gift in scripture and uh, as it was manifested in the life and ministry of Ellen White, that particular woman that we talked about. Um, I invite you to uh, study the things, go to the resources that we uh, mention at the end of uh, the session, go to the website of the White Estate, you will find um, amazing resources there, helpful answers to questions you might have and resources that you can use. And uh, I hope we see you again for our other discussions on what Adventists believe. May God richly bless you.